Good morning and welcome to Harrisville Baptist Church. We're so glad to see y'all here this morning. I'm going to ask y'all would please stand, go shake a hand, and help us finish singing this song. Amen? All right. upon us. We ask, Lord, now that you would be with those in our community who are sick and need your, and need your care and, 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 our, and comfort those that in our church family and all that have lost loved ones. Dear Lord, we ask now that you would just be with the services today, be with the Brother Rich as he brings a message and just uh, pray for anybody that might be here, dear Lord, that needs to make a decision, they'll make it today. Go with us now through the coming week. We ask forgive us for our many sins and this things in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. On this next one, this is one of my favorites uh, that we do and sometimes we can do songs and they might have a, a different meaning than we think, but this is an older one but the meaning of it's great. How many of you are sports fans? 
I told Cal Neely last week, he needs to, he doesn't have any tattoos. I said, you need to get Ole Miss tattooed right here. Because every time I see him, he has an Ole Miss polo on. And you can always see Ole Miss. And so I know Connor likes Green Bay. He's always in his Green Bay hat. But that doesn't mean Connor worships that hat. Does that make sense? He loves the team, but that doesn't mean he worships the team. He just loves the team, right? Same thing with Kyle. I don't know. He might worship Ole Miss. We don't know yet. But it's the same way with this song. We sing about the old rugged cross. We're not worshiping the cross. We are worshiping what the cross represents and who the cross represents. And so what Jesus did on the cross is the reason. I know some people say, well, you shouldn't wear crosses. He said don't make idols out of stuff. That's not why. We don't worship the little crosses we wear as necklaces or rings or or, or earrings or whatever. It's a reminder of what happened on that cross. And so we took, or Jesus took one of the most horrific things that the Romans ever created, which is crucifixion, and he chose to die that way to, for us. And so now we take the cross, and so whenever we look at it or whenever we sing about it, it hopefully reminds us of how awesome Jesus is and what he's done for us. So we're fixing to do the old rugged cross. ourselves up and, and feel bad about ourselves because that's what we do, that's what I do. Um, but it's not what I say I am, it's who he says I am. And it says who the sun sets free, it's free indeed. A lot of times 
as Christians, we can beat ourselves up about living, still living in a sinful body and a sinful world. But Jesus says, yes, don't do that. Try not to sin. That's kind of the goal. You know, but if you mess up, I'm here. Forgiveness is here. I'm always going to be there. So um, this song is who you say I am.
the service this morning, if you feel like a uh, jet engine is about to uh, take off, it's our air conditioner over here, but don't worry, we've had special prayer that above all else, the air conditioning will stay working this morning, all right? That's important on a July Sunday morning, at least while I'm the pastor of a church, it's going to be important. Uh, no, it seems like it's, uh, it's got a motor that's going out, so if you hear it, if you walk by this wall and you feel it kind of vibrating, that's that motor going on, so I uh, appreciate our Building and Grounds folks getting that going. Uh, in all seriousness, though, there are so many blessings that we have that we get to enjoy sitting in uh, padded pews with great carpet under our feet, a beautiful roof over our head, uh, air conditioning, praise the Lord this morning, uh, great sound and, and, and video uh, and all this technology. Around. We have so many things that help us and that, that keep us from getting you know, into all the, the difficulties and distractions uh, that, that help us point towards worshiping our God together this morning. Uh, so many of the things that so many Christians throughout all the world this morning right now uh, are struggling through to be able to do a worship service, to be able to have time to corporately come together and worship our God. Man, aren't you thankful this morning that God has given us even, even above and beyond, that, that we would be able to have some of those hardships taken away to have, have us be able to freely and openly worship him. And I hope and pray that for me and for you, for those of you watching at home, uh, for, for whoever we are, 
that we take advantage of every single convenience, every single help to be able to worship him more, to be able to praise him louder, to be able to give him more of our heart, to focus more of our mind on him because he has blessed us in so many ways with things that we don't absolutely need but that can help us to focus on him this morning. Last week we left off in the middle of, or or kind of about two-thirds of the way through if you're being honest, uh, Colossians chapter 3 in our sermon series that's been called Jesus Plus Nothing. And Paul was writing in chapter 3, the first little bit of it there, uh, to the church at Colossae and reminding them that their salvation, and also now that we read it 2,000 years later, our salvation is built on, based on, and hinges on Jesus and nothing else. Not our behavior, not our past, not our future, not what denomination of church we're in or whether we're sitting in a pew or not. It is Jesus plus nothing. And as he wrote that to him at the end of the passage we shared last week, uh, and some of you, if you were here, you got the homework assignment that you were going to go and read that and see if that lines up with your life. You can still do that if you're like, oh man, I forgot about that. You can read it today after church. It's okay. Uh, It's good to read it all the time, to be honest with you. He leaves off in verse 17 and he told us, hey, whatever you do, do it as though you are serving the Lord. Whatever you do, do it for him. Do it in him. That's what our goal is. That's what all these blessings that he gives us, especially in a country where we're free to do the worship practices that point towards him and glorify him. That's what we're supposed to do. In everything, not just our church and worship times, not just the times where we are focusing on him, but in everything we could focus our lives on the one who gave his life and who gave us salvation if we put our faith in him. Now, the more we think about that over years, and we were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school, uh, the more we think about that, it's easy for us as we live some time to start to make comparisons, right? To, to talk about how it used to be compared to how it seems to be and maybe indeed is now. And all of us, whether we're, <laughs> whether we're 15 or 85, right? We look back and go, oh, I remember when it used to be like this, but now it's something else. And one of the things we talk about a lot when we do that is about families, right? We talk about how, well, man, family used to be so important, but now everybody's so busy and they just run all these different directions. The family's not important as it used to be. It used to be good, and now it's bad. Paul, in the last part of chapter 3 in the book of Colossians, points something out to us. That, hey, look. Families have been places where temptation, sin, disrespect, frustration, broken relationships, families have been the arena that that's been happening in for a long, long time. Broken families are not new. There were broken families when you and I were growing up, no matter how old you and I may be. There were broken families at the church at Colossae. God has a direction for those families. God has a direction for all of his people. What we're seeing here in these next few verses this morning will be this. Is that the problems that seem so new aren't that new. The problems that we experience now that we say are so, you know, so bad now, it's just the way that human nature, and as we talked about in Sunday school in our class this morning, the following of our own desires, this is just the way this goes. But it's not new. We may know a lot more about it. We may read a lot more about it. We might be able to pull up our phone and and find out about, you might be able to find out about my family, I might be able to find out about your family sitting here this morning. We don't even have to have a conversation about it, we just know these things because it's on social media and it's on this and it's on that. We may be more aware of it, but these things are not new. Paul is talking to the church at Colossae in, in the book of Colossians and saying to them, look, it's about Jesus. And if that was true in the first century, it's also true 21st century, right? It hasn't changed. Because the same desires that led to broken families, disobedience, disrespect, and sinful uh, attitudes and actions then still do it today. And so the word is still as true as it ever was and as important as it ever was. It's not because the world's so much worse. It's because the truth's still the truth. Sadly, human nature is still human nature. So what does Paul say? Right after he says, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord, he says in verse 18 in Colossians chapter 3, 
He says this, he says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. What we see in these short verses, and, and, and to the church at Colossae, this is not something uncommon that Paul would mention in his letters to other churches. Church at Colossae, he goes a little short with them, straight, simple, to the point. What we see here is, is that Jesus orders families. Do you get that this morning? I want to tell you this morning that if your family is ordered and built around anything other than Jesus, don't be surprised when things go wrong. Don't be surprised when it's not as close-knit as you'd like for it to be. Don't be surprised when the relationships don't work the way you'd like for them to. Because even when Jesus is the center, even when Jesus is the one that orders our families, we still have to battle against our own human and selfish natures. Even so much more when he's not the one that we recognize as the head of us and the head of us in our families and therefore the head of our families. Jesus orders families. What does that mean? Well, there's, uh, we'll, we'll do a little wordplay here. First off, he commands families, right? I mean, that, that idea of, you know, the old Three Stooges line, you know, they say order in the court. And, of course, we know that when the judge says that, he means, hey, calm down, be quiet, be reverent, order in the court. And one of the Stooges says, I'll have a ham on rye, right? You know, anybody know who the Three Stooges are? Just me staying up late at watching TV when I was a kid? Okay. All right, so I'll have a ham on rye. So there's two, two ways of doing that. You know, what do I want, but also bringing order to. And I think that's true in what we're saying this morning. Jesus orders family. He commands it. He says, look, uh, this is what I want. God himself, God, Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when he made humanity, he made us in his image. And he set up the family as that in, most intimate of relationship to show us how to have a relationship, to show us how to experience love and to share love, how to serve one another, and how to find that comfort and that acceptance that we don't always find in the rest of the world. He commanded that there be families. But then also he brings order to families. And he gives us all distinct roles. Now I'm not going to get real deep into, well, if one group's doing this, if fathers are doing this, or husbands are doing that, or wives and children are doing their thing, well, that's the only way that each of them go. I believe that with all of this, it's implied that in love for our families, we'd all do these things. But he does speak to roles. He speaks to individual groups of people within the family. Well, first off, what does he say? He says, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Oh, man. Oh, that's, that's, that is upholding and propping up the patriarchy, and that's, that is discrimination against women. No, it's not. No, it's not. I've been to a lot of weddings. I haven't been to all the weddings that have ever happened, but I've been to a lot of weddings. I've yet to be to a wedding where at the, at the altar, the man and the woman getting married, the woman looks and says, now look, I love you, but I'm going to do whatever I want. No, what do they say? They, they, we do vows, right? We vow to be with one another in sickness and in health. We vow to be with each other in rich and in poor. And we, we vow until death do us part. That sounds a lot like submission to me, doesn't it? And that's not a bad thing. We celebrate that. We take great videos of that. We dress up for that and spend a lot of money to say that in front of God, in front of our friends and family. Then how can it be offensive later, <laughs> right? There's nothing wrong with submitting ourselves. The only thing that comes up to be wrong with that is when we're not in a culture that embraces submitting to anybody. And this morning, sadly, we live and have lived for a great bit of time, if not all of our individual lives, in a culture that doesn't believe you should have to submit to anybody. I got one big problem with that. If I'm not supposed to submit to anybody because of what my freedoms are or what my you know, my thoughts and my opinions are, I'm going to have a real hard time submitting to the God that I can't see with my eyes. There's nothing wrong with submitting to the proper and appropriate authorities. There's nothing wrong at all. Most of us in the room, we pay our taxes. Do we like it? No. I don't, I've never met anybody who's like, man, I'm so glad I get to pay extra taxes this year. Not at all. But we pay them. Why? Because the authority says to, and if we don't, there'll be consequences. Even if we don't know what those consequences may be, we've heard stories and seen movies, right, about what they could be, and we don't want that. And so we submit to that authority. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it. 
Well, that's a totally different ball game with a few similarities, but it's totally different when it comes to submitting to God. Remember, he says, wives, submit to your hus- yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. First off, he's saying this is what should happen. Does that mean that husbands can run roughshod over their wives and wives are supposed to be doormats? Absolutely not. Praise God that he has put within so many godly and Christian ladies a fierce spirit of independence and leadership and love and care. I I wouldn't be where I am without those ladies in my life. You probably wouldn't be where you are if it's good without those ladies in your life. This is not telling women that they're less than. This is not telling women that they should just do whatever their husbands say. He says, women... Wives, submit yourselves to your husband as is fitting in the Lord. Remember what the picture of the church is. The church is the bride of Christ, the husband, the bridegroom. What is the church supposed to do? How does it fit into what God says? We're supposed to submit to Christ. Do we submit to him because he's a cruel taskmaster? No. We submit to him because of what the next verse says. Husbands... Love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So here's the thing. People want to pull out verse 18 and say, oh, see, the Bible is old-fashioned. The Bible doesn't understand that women can do just as many things as men can do, that we can do all this stuff and sometimes do it better than men. And so the Bible's out of date is what a lot of people say. And they want to pull that and say, see, the Bible says you have to submit to these men. These men don't know what they're doing. They're, they're just, you know, they figure if they're just the loudest person in the room, they're right. Sorry, men, we do that sometimes, don't we? That, may, that part may be true sometimes. But they say, oh, that, the Bible's out of date. But then they don't even look at verse 19 when they say that. They don't even look at when God says for, wi- for women as wives to submit to their husbands, he says, and husbands, this is who you should be for this whole thing to work. Husbands, if we're out there and we are harsh, and we are unloving to our wives, they should have a problem submitting to us because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. So how could we ever even think about beginning to stand on some soapbox or at some pulpit and tell them they need to submit more if we're not willing to love and not be harsh? In fact, in this order of families in Colossians chapter 3, we actually, as, as guys, we get two instructions. The other groups just get one each. God orders families. He doesn't just tell one to be the doormat. He tells us all how to work together, how to live out the picture of what is real in him when it comes to his church. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord, but husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Husbands, if we're creating an environment where our wives are walking on eggshells just not to tick us off because we think that we've done everything all day, and, and, you know, this is still kind of a somewhat old-fashioned idea because I know a lot of our wives, a lot of moms are working now too and have been for some time. But if men think that what we do is just so important and, oh, yeah, God made me the head of the household, and we come home and make an environment in our home with our, our wives where they have to be afraid of angering us, it's not them that's wrong. It's us. And the core of us being wrong in that is because we're taking on this idea that we may be Christian husbands and we're supposed to be the head, but we're also adding to it a bunch of other stuff. But remember, Colossians, the whole book tells us it's Jesus plus nothing. And what Jesus tells us is husbands, love your wives. Forgive us as men if we expect our wives to submit and follow our authority if our authority doesn't look like the authority of Jesus Christ. Because that is not how he set it up to be. He set it up that as husbands, we would have put our faith in the Lord and we would be living, looking more and more like Him every day, that we would be doing whatever we do as husbands in a way that is for the Lord, not just for our own selfish nature and gratification. If we do it that way, then yes, they're going to want to submit. They're going to want to follow that type of leadership. But there are too many households in churches and outside of churches, too many households where dad, husband, the man's not pulling his weight And the wife is having to do way more than she ever should have to do on her own. Shame on us men when that's the case for us. The good news about that is is that there's a way out of that. That we would actually subscribe to and submit to Jesus plus nothing and that we would live for him and he will change us and he will make us to be husbands that love our wives and are not harsh to them. 
In verse 20, he switches a little bit of gears and starts talking to children. He said, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Here again, we say now, well, what about those parents that aren't right to their kids? Well, this is after instructing parents, or right before really specifically instructing parents to be right before their kids. Man, children are meant to submit to their parents. Right? They're meant to obey them. In fact, that's something that's not just a new command that Jesus brought. That's been around since the commandments were about, uh, since they were around. Those Ten Commandments, what is one of them? Say it. Honor your father and mother. How do you honor your father and mother? And we're all children of a father and mother somewhere. We obey them. That's one of the basics. That's one of the beginnings. It's not just, it's not just hey, go make something of your life and do it your own way. Honor your father and mother. We're taught in the New Testament that this is actually the command that has a promise with it, right? That it will go well with you in the land, that you will do well when we obey our parents. So it's not unfitting that Paul writes, children, obey your parents in everything. But what about the stuff I don't want to do? Obey them in that too. What about the stuff they won't let me do that I want to go do? Hey, obey them in that too. How we obey our parents as their children It's a direct picture of how we obey God as our Heavenly Father, and there's no way to divorce the two from one another. There's no way to separate it. You show me a child who doesn't obey their parents, well, and I'll show you someone who struggles in their faith to follow God, because usually the problem is not just simply their parents and what they're telling them to do or telling them not to do. It's uh, It's the problem of submitting to authority in general. Why does God order families? It's to point us to Him, to give us a picture of what being in his family is all about. Being in his kingdom is all about. He says, children, obey your parents. Children of the God that is our heavenly father, obey him. We should obey our earthly parents as well. Well, what if my earthly parents are, are jerks? What if they're not Christians? What if they're telling me to do wrong things? Uh, you know, what, what do I do then? What if, what if, what if? You know, that does happen. But a lot of times I hear that a lot more from people who that's not the case with, and they just want to be able to do their own thing and have an excuse for it. Dealt with students for 25 years as a youth pastor. And I can't tell you how many times as I counseled with students over and over again, and they'd say, well, I know the Bible. I know you've been teaching us. We've been hearing about it in Sunday school and hearing in our church services, and I'm supposed to obey my parents, but my parents aren't Christians. Yes, the setup is that the parents would be loving the Lord, but here's the thing. If you're a child, whether you're a child child or a teenage child or an adult child of unchristian parents, The command still is to you to honor them, still is to you to obey them, because how you obey them, even when it's not what you like, to the extent that it only goes to where you would not be sinning against God by obeying them, well, guess what? That might be one of the things that the Lord leads to lead them, uses to lead them to Christ. Your obedience, when they know that you believe differently to them, might be one of the biggest witnesses you can have in your parents' life. He says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And then he comes back to dads. He says, fathers, back to men, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. It's kind of interesting that verse 21 and verse 19, both spoken to men, spoken specifically to Christian men, they deal with our attitude. They deal with our delivery. What do we know about men? And probably the, those of us that are a little older in the room might be able to identify with this a little bit more because there was a time in our culture where men were not expected and, and were not therefore very good about sharing emotion, right? It was something in our culture that said that men are supposed to be more stoic and more steadfast and more you know, stand-up type guys. And, and, and sometimes many people in our, in our culture over the years have even gone without ever hearing their father say that they love them. There's songs about that. There's movies about that. Sadly, there's real-life stories about that. Because in our culture, if you, if men weren't raised to know how to experience, much less communicate that type of love. And some of them just passed it on from their, you know, the lack of love they felt from their fathers had just carried on. And, and here in, in more recent times, it's become a little different in our culture that, that dads would be able to openly show love. Now, some of you grew up, some of us grew up with fathers that showed uh, tremendous amounts of appropriate emotion in our lives, but many people did not. It's interesting to me that when Paul and the Holy Spirit is talking to men, he's talking to them about making sure that we're loving, 
making sure that we're not harsh, making sure that we don't embitter our children. You know, one way to, to quickly embitter your children is to tell them to live a life that you're not willing to live yourself. One way to embitter your children is to do that whole deal about do as I say, not as I do. Well, let me tell you how that plays out. Not well. Back in the 80s as a kid, you know, the war on drugs was going on, the Just Say No campaign, and there was a pretty emotionally charged commercial where a, a dad is, uh, is going through his son's room and he finds some drugs in a little box and, and he confronts his child about it. It's pretty heavy for a commercial, right? Uh, but it was. This was a commercial part of that campaign. And, and they, he found this, these drugs, and he goes, and he, he's, he's con, you know, confronting his son about it. He said, where would you get this? Where would you learn how to do this? And the son wraps up the commercial by saying, Dad, I learned it from you. And you get the impression that the dad was a drug abuser. And so no matter how many rules he set up or how many times he told his son not to do them, what did the son do? What the dad did. How many times do we see that? It's funny, you know, uh, a lot of us stay in the same place for a long time in our lives. Uh, for me, you know, it's been kind of interesting after a 20-year gap of being here in the church at Harrisville and living in the community to where now some of the, you know, some of the, the sons now are the age their dads were when I knew them the first time. And it's amazing how, how far the apple doesn't fall from the tree and how they do. I mean, even how they walk, right, how they move and their mannerisms and things like that. A great way to embitter your children would be to tell them to live a life that you're not willing to live because they're going to follow the way you live. And if you're, as a dad, constantly getting on to them for being like you, that's going to embitter them quick because that doesn't seem fair, and it's not. And it doesn't seem right, and it's not. Paul says, fathers, don't embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Now, some dads would sit back and go, good, they need to be discouraged from doing all that crazy stuff. That's not what he's talking about here. They'll be discouraged because, dads, how we show love to our sons and our daughters is going to shape their picture of their heavenly father more than anything else on the planet. True. Watch it play out in life. Doesn't matter how many great preachers they sit under. Doesn't matter how many great coaches they may have. Doesn't matter how many male teachers they have or males, uh, men that have put, made an influence in their lives. More people who have, a trouble, have trouble understanding their Heavenly Father, are, it's because they have a broken relationship or a father who is discouraged to the point that they are embittered. It's not the only reason it happens, but it's a huge reason that it happens. You know, it's, it's almost become cliche to talk about people having daddy issues. This speaks right to it. Fathers, we've got to be who we're supposed to be because God has called us to be that. And He has ordered, and He does order, family because the family is where everything we understand about God starts you say no 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 no, rich we go to church for that well let me just tell you let me let you in on a dirty little secret your church actions your church attendance your church attitude can be perfect but if it doesn't match what's at home your home life's going to win out in the lives of your family every single Far be it from us to be people who would teach our kids how to go and act Christian in church when at home we're not. Forgive us if that's the case. Jesus orders families. He commands that they exist. He institutionalizes them and he puts them in order that we would all follow him because each of these four instructions to these four different groups, wives, husbands, children, fa children fathers, all of those that he's telling us what to do, he's telling us, godly Christian characteristics to embody. Jesus orders family. And now after telling us that instruction, that again, is not uncommon in Paul's letters, he goes back and he talks about God being our audience. And in fact, this morning, we have you know, this responsibility to our families, but our family is not our main audience. It just came after verse 17 where he said, whatever you do, do it for the Lord. Well, guess what? Even in our families, God is our audience. He goes on in verse 22 and he says this. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now look, this morning it might be a little uncomfortable to talk about 
families because families represent a lot of different situations. When God is being revealed and taught and reminded to us that he is our audience, Paul doesn't hold back at just the uncomfortableness of families. He deals with slavery. Slaves don't have a choice. Slaves are literally owned in this culture that he's writing to, as well as in other cultures, by their masters. And masters aren't always good. And yes, there were people who had given their life to Christ that still, learned, uh, still owned slaves at that point. And they were trying to figure out, what does this all look like? Again, people will pull verse 22 out of chapter 3 and say, oh, see, the Bible's outdated again. It, it endorses slavery. And we know that's not the right thing to do, right? But no, what he's saying here is, I mean, think about when this is. We're talking about mere decades that this Jesus has done what he's done on the cross and who has risen from the dead. This church is brand new, and people are still under the revelation of God trying to figure out how to do this. And I don't think what God is saying here through Paul, as he says in other places in the New Testament, I don't think what he's saying is, hey, it's good for you to be a slave and good for somebody to be your master. No, he's giving these slaves that have put their faith in Christ, that are part of this church at Colossae, whether their masters have or not. He's saying, just because you became a Christian, you still have to go back to that house. You still have to go back to that household. You're still a slave. What do you do in the meantime? Well, that's a question for all of us, right? A lot of us might even think this way. We might say, well, you know what? When, uh, when God sets this all right, I'll do what he says because then it'll be easier. He's not telling us what to do for when it's perfect. He's telling us how to live right now when it's imperfect. He's our audience. If we're our audience, well then, hey, I shouldn't even be a slave. There shouldn't even be slavery. And I don't disagree with that. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that slavery is good in any way, but it, it is existing. It happens. It happened then. It happens now, sadly. And people who are Christians find themselves being slaves. Well, how do you do that? Do you rise up and revolt and kill the masters? That's not what Scripture says. He says slaves. Don't do that. He says obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eyes on you and to curry their favor. Don't just do it to earn brownie points or to be treated better. Do it with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord because the, the Lord, God, is our audience. God's our audience. We lose track of that daily in our lives, don't we? I do. So often we think our audience is the people around us. We think the audience is the people who we don't want to let down or the people who we think look up to us or the people who we think are even against us and so we want to show them how good we are and how good we can be. Anytime we make someone else, our audience, above God, we're off. We're performing for the wrong crowd. And everything we do and what we do will be shaped by who we're doing it for. If God's our audience, then submission comes easier. It doesn't come easy, but it comes easier. Because we know it's not about that person who, you know, in our sinfulness and in our selfish desires, we're like, no, absolutely not. By God, they're not going to get one over on me. They're not going to have the satisfaction of beating me. But God says, that's not the point. That's not the point at all. It's not about showing how big and bad and tough and strong you are. It's about submitting to the Lord, who is stronger or tougher <laughs> than we've ever thought about being in the midst of something that we would be tempted to stand up for ourselves. You say, Rich, that doesn't sound really right. I think I should stand up for myself. You, you tell me. Who'd be better to stand up for you, you or God? I'll take God every time over what I can stand up for myself. That's why we have trouble understanding, turn the other cheek. <laughs> because to us, hit me once, you're not going to get a chance to do it again, right? We want to say that. And that all sounds good. That all plays well in stories and news articles and movies and all that stuff. But that's not what God teaches us. We have our choice. If God's our audience, we do what he says to please him. If somebody else is our audience, we do what they say to please them, maybe even ourselves. Where our audience lies, where we recognize who we recognize as our audience, also determines the end of it, the, the result of it. And what we find out in Scripture is our reward is with Christ. Verse 23, in the next couple of verses, Paul says this, he says, whatever you do, still talking to slaves, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Folks, this morning what he's telling us is this. If we are going to let everybody here that we see be our audience, then if we win that, if everything goes great, the best reward we can get is the best reward they can get. That's it. Think about it for a second. If you're a musical act, if you're a band or a singer or an instrumentalist, and you play in front of millions of people, well, you're going to get a reward from those people. They bought tickets to come see you. They're going to buy your, you know, your, your albums or download your music online. They're going to buy your T-shirt and your hats and all your merchandise. Uh, they're going to they're going to buy the book that comes out about you, the movie that comes out, and you're going to get money, and you're going to get their applause, and you're going to get the fame that comes with it. So by the same token, if you play in little small rooms, well, you're going to get what that audience can give you. Probably not going to sell as many t-shirts and hats. Probably not going to have as many downloads on your album. Probably not going to hear the loud applause. You get the reward that your audience can give. If God is our reward, our reward, or excuse me, if God is our audience, a reward can't be outgiven by anybody. This morning, what Paul's telling us as he order as God orders families, as he tells us, hey, look, what you're doing in your family is about how you submit to God, about how you perform for him, how you lay your life out for him in front of him, for his glory and for his approval, not for each other, not for somebody else, not for the neighbors. And when God is our audience, we understand that our reward is in Christ. He's telling slaves right here who literally do not have the freedom that you and I enjoy. He's telling them, hey, you're not working as a slave for what your master on earth can give you. He's not your audience. Your heavenly master is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the one, the three in one God, the one true God is your audience. And he's the one whose reward you're seeking. I don't know about you this morning. I don't know what's going on in every family. I don't know what's going on in every heart. I don't know this morning when you walked in here who your audience has been this morning or all week or all your life up to this point. I don't know all that. I'm not able to know that. I don't have to know all that. Because I know this. If that audience isn't God, you're probably struggling. And even if you're being successful, it's not always going to feel that way. Even if right now it's like, no, you know what? We're doing our own thing, Rich. Thanks for speaking to us this morning. Appreciate that. I know that's your job, but I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing. Just wait till the struggles come. Right now, so many folks who were riding high on a great economy, they're not riding so high right now. Because the reward was their bank account or their 401K or the things they were planning for and their assets and their futures. And that looks a little different now because of what's going on in the world. They might have sat under a message from somebody from God's word that said, hey, you need to be looking at your reward coming in Christ, not here on this earth. And they said, hey, that's great, but man, I got all these cars and boats and houses and all this money in the bank. And then all of a sudden now, give it a few years. and Oh, man, it's all going away. I lost this much. It's all gone. My business is shut down. I've been fired. I've been laid off. I've this and that. The suffering comes and goes. Right? So if things are going well for you right now and God's not your audience, don't expect that that's going to last forever because it doesn't. What lasts forever is the only one who is forever, and that is God. And he is our audience, and in him we find our reward. Why does it matter what we do with our family? Because what we do in and with our family is a way to please the Lord, to honor him, the one who's given us life. This morning, the truth is that our reward is with Christ. Where is your reward this morning? The truth is, every reward that's worth having is in Christ. For you this morning, where's your reward? Are you working towards and working for an audience of, of God himself? Or is it somebody else? This morning, if it's somebody else, you might need to ask yourself the question, have I ever trusted Jesus with my entire life? And if the answer is no, then why not today? Why not today? Would you be, why wouldn't you be lifted up today out of that rat race of trying to please other people and please the one that is only, the only one worth pleasing? The only one worth chasing after a reward from. Maybe you'd give your life to Christ in our time of invitation and response in just a moment. Maybe this morning you have put your faith in Jesus. You are a Christian, but you still struggle. If we're being honest, that's all of us. But maybe specifically this morning there's some things that God's calling you to come back from. That God's saying, hey, look, 
Remember, I'm your audience. Remember your rewards with me. Stop chasing this other stuff. Live in the salvation that you now have and experience it in a way that you haven't experienced in a while. Maybe this morning you're a believer, but you need to come back to that audience of, of God himself, that reward that only comes from him. Maybe God wants to do something else in your heart. Maybe it's bringing you to be a member of our church. If that's the case, then we will, we will op- with open arms, welcome you in and be excited about it. Maybe there's something you need to pray about here at this altar or right where you sit. Maybe there's a relationship you need to mend because you know that that's what God is calling you to do because he's mended the relationship between you and him through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Whatever it is this morning, folks, this is not just the time where we gather our stuff. This is not just the time where we go, okay, that was a good service, now let's move on. This is the time when we say, okay, God, you've spoken to me, however you've spoken. Now I want to make this commitment to you. Whatever commitment he's calling you to make, would you make it in him today? Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. Lord God, we thank you that today you are working in our hearts. Father, for the one who doesn't know you, today as you're working and knocking on the door of their hearts, would you let them let you in by giving them the the willingness to submit their whole lives to you, that you might become, through Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Father, for those who are lost this morning, would you save them today? Father God, for those of us who are saved, would you help us to remember who our audience is and where our reward is and where it comes from and where it needs to come from. Father, whatever business you need to do in our hearts, would you do so now and let us respond in faithfulness and obedience to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Pray with me, please. Father and God, as we come before you today, Lord, 
So many things are going on in the world. So many things are going on in, in many lives, Lord, the sickness and problems of health. Many, Lord, that we know who people have lost family members. Lord, we look at this sometimes and wonder, what is our purpose? We, we, we don't understand sometimes. We'd be so devastated by the things that happen in our life, Lord, that, that we have to wonder, are we doing what we need to be doing? Lord, what do you want me to be doing? Lord, we continue to, in our church, Lord, we pray that you continue to help us grow, Lord, to help us to understand what our purpose is in that we ask you for the guidance and direction that we need, that you lead us, Lord, to make the decisions we need to make every day and do it in a manner, Lord, that will be pleasing to you. As we come before you now, Lord, it's a portion of our service. We pray that, that you not only bless this offering, bless the, not only the gift, but the giver itself, and that we use it to your kingdom's glory. Be saved for us in Christ's name. Amen. our musicians as always. Our ministry spotlight this morning, I just want to tell you two things. I'm going to let Steele tell you in just a second about UTBS. Uh, on your way in or if not on your way out, I hope you picked up a, uh, one of the forms there. It's, uh, it's our deacon nomination form. It's come that time of year by our bylaws. We, uh, we seek God's will through our, our folks here, the members of our church, as to who to nominate, which men for deacons for the coming church year and the years to come. Uh, and so today we're not doing the actual nomination. We just want you to have that list in your hand. 
So if you pick one up, take it with you, pray over it. If you don't have one yet, you can pick one up on the way out. There's also some back here at the Welcome Center, uh, so you can get it either direction you may go. Pray over who God would have you to nominate, and we will do our nominations. You'll fill that form out, and you will turn it in next Sunday on the 17th, as you saw in the bulletin and on our, worship, or excuse me, our announcement screen for worship this morning. So uh, take that with you. Pray over who you might nominate as a deacon. Uh, Steele's going to share a word about Youth BBS, and then we're going to dismiss those of you who are not members of our church uh, as we sing Family of God, but we are going to stick around for just a second and uh, do a quick business meeting. I know that's not what you want to hear on a Sunday morning, but I promise it'll be quick just in a purchase that we approve that we need to work on just one little thing uh, after that. So after we sing Family of God in just a moment, if you're visiting with us, if you're watching at home, we hope you have a great rest of the day. Uh, we won't be streaming about the business part of the, of the service. Uh, but we hope you have a great rest of the day and come back and be with us this evening. And if you're members, just stick around with us after Family of God in just a few moments. Steve, tell us about Youth VBS. Amen. All right. Yeah, we're having a youth, I like this phrase, we're having a youth VBS on the 13th through the 15th from 6 to 9. It's Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We're doing something on Saturday. I don't know yet. Um, but um, Wednesday night, we're eating a meal like a regular, our regular meal. And then Wednesday night, we're also, after um, we get done with the regular service, the um, adults and the youth are going to go to the um, ball field and have a kickball tournament. Um, this is if you if you're an adult, you want to play, go see Kyle. If you're a youth and want to play, you have to play anyway. Come see me. Um, so we just we'll take it easy on the the adults. Um, Thursday night we are doing the same thing. We're coming. We're going to eat at six. Then we're going to have worship and the word. We're going to have games in the gym. And then Friday night we're the same thing. You're going to be at six. Worship word, eat worship word, and then we're going to go have some fun at Brother Ken's house. Um, so Saturday we're going to do some of this. So if you have a youth that comes here that's not here this morning and wants to come, just let them know. Um, we're, it's open. Um, bring a donation of about 10 bucks to kind of help offset whatever. But other than that, y'all come if you don't have it, that's fine. Come anyway. We'd love to have every youth here that's here and not here um, at this. Amen. Say to that, we have a youth committee meeting at 3 30 to go over and iron out everything else. So, put that on. So, if y'all would please stand and we'll sing Family to God. Mm -hmm. 